Good evening, everybody. Nice to see you all here. Thanks for coming out on a Tuesday night. It's a good crowd. So, basically, uh, we'd like to acknowledge that we're on the traditional territory of the Kwan and Dan and the the uh, Tan Kwachan First uh, Council, Tan Kwachan Council, thanks for that. We'd also like to uh, say welcome to a few of our MLAs. I see uh, Raj Pillau in the house, as well as Liz Hansen and Kate White. Thank you for coming. We'll just take a moment to thank our sponsors, and we have quite a few of them. You saw Peter Mather's pictures here. Peter Mather's uh, kindly donated all these pictures for the cause. He uh, couldn't be here tonight because he's in the field. Uh, he tells me he's photographing, but I'm not sure that it's feasible, but he's photographing uh, wolverines. So whether he gets to that, that mission completes another story. I'd also like to then thank WCS, the Wildlife Conservation Society of Canada, and in particular Don Reed for all the big effort he's put into getting this uh, event organized. Thank you, Don. Then also to uh, the Porter Creek Community Association, who gave a huge donation to this cause, and they've been instrumental in being right at the beginning of the development of the Friends of McIntyre Creek. They've been part of us. Then also to see pause, and thanks to Chris and Nadine for their input, and to YCS, the Yukon Conservation Society, and particularly in uh, um, Julia, who's done uh, masterful work with all the printing of uh, posters and programs. And then, interestingly, we would like to thank Capital Heli Helicopter for uh, a great donation for giving us a flight to give uh, Harvey an insight into the whole dimensions of the creek, and we had a wonderful flight this morning, perfect weather from the, from the mouth of the, uh, the McIntyre Creek at, at the Yukon River, right up into past Fish Lake and over the mountains to the source of McIntyre Creek. It was a wonderful trip and uh, highly recommend it for anybody. Thank you, Del Mar, for that. Then I'd also like to thank Nahani River Adventures, uh, Neil Hart uh, Hartling for this, uh, being part of this. And then we have a couple of uh, door prizes and I'm not sure, I think there's kind of uh, Descent on whether we're going to do it after after Harvey's speech, or is it going to be done by email? Do you know, Celeste? No, we don't have. I'll, I'll get back to that. So the the, the door prizes are are from Ari, uh, Epic Pizza um, for a gift certificate for hundred dollars, and uh, canoe people is either a rental of a canoe or a kayak or stand up board. And I'd like to at last, at last to uh, acknowledge the Yukon uh, Art Center staff who've done a great job. It's been really seamless organizing this event. And I'd like to thank um, Nicole and Mike up there in the sound department tonight. Thank you very much. Just for your information, this has been recorded tonight, and the the uh, the idea of this is to have it available for communities later on down the line, so they can show this any time they wish. So I ask if uh, anybody has their cell phones not turned off yet, just to power them down now, and then I'll spend a few minutes just elucidating what uh, what Friends of McIntyre Creek is all about and why we're here tonight. I suspect quite a few, most of you know who we are. And it's really it's well documented, well written on the program on the back side of the, uh, the the printout there today, and it's a really good description of what we do. And we've been going for nearly 10 years, and basically our whole mission is to be stewards of McIntyre Creek and and protect it as far as we can. And that involves doing shoreline cleanups, invasive pulls, and we've last year had to get a helicopter to haul huge amount of trash in in the form of freezers, skidoo parts mattresses, tires out of the canyon. I don't know if you've ever driven up, I've driven up Fish Lake Raid Road where it turns off, there's a beautiful canyon view there. Well, they took that as an opportunity to dump and still do dump down there. And it took us four helicopter net loads to $2,000 to get that out just for 
the public's information so that it's a very expensive business removing trash. So why are we here this evening? And really the objective is to try and get people more involved in, in the environment and nature per se. And by doing that, we can try and push who's ever concerned with developing legislation, be it the, uh, the mayor and council or Yukon territorial government, to legislate protection for McIntyre Creek as a park and thereby we have entrenched systems that we can work with and, and, and know that we're dealing with a protected, a protected environment. And having traversed that today, it's just spectacular and it's widespread and it's uh, something we should all be part of. So what can we do about it? And I think briefly, briefly just trying to engender some engagement and involvement with people. Uh, and speak to your neighbors, write letters to the editor, speak to your MLAs at the grocery store, pull them aside, tell them we want this park. Uh, I think the, the Chadburn Lake Park delegate de designation has been successful, and so hopefully we're next on the list to get the park for McIntyre Creek. So all in all, uh, I think it's our obligation to protect, to protect nature for nature's sake and for our own sake, so we need to really move on this before it's too late as we see on the news daily, the disintegration and degradation of our environment worldwide. And Harvey's going to get into de detail about that. And it's been really, uh, really, I thought I was kind of enthusiastic natural naturalist and uh, environmentalist. But af after having spent two days with Harvey, I'm just totally enthralled and enlightened by it all. And I've got a bit more verve to get going. So at this point, I think I'd just like to call on um, Chris Ryder of the Seaports, he's the executive director of Seaports, just to introduce Harvey. And uh, I'm really uh, enthralled to listen to what Harvey has to say today. We did, we did go to uh, Wood Street School today, and that was quite enlightening, seeing a class of uh, 15 people, and Harvey really got to them uh, in a meaningful way and really pushed them for their feelings on what it's all about. It, there's, some, uh, there's some, some quite scary stuff like the despair amongst the children, uh, and we hope to, to break that despair by giving hope, and that's what Harvey is here for tonight. I might want to just tell you a little experience I had in, in, uh, in, in McIntyre Creek. I was, my home is on the east side of McIntyre Creek, and I, can over, I don't quite see the, the creek, but I see the embankment that goes up towards the dump, and it was this time of year, a year ago, and the, the snow had not melted yet, and I saw these kind of tracings going down the side of the slope. I thought, what is that? Is that just snowballs running down, running down? What the hell is that? And I put my glasses, my binoculars on that, and I saw the ravens. They were doing, having snow baths, and then tobogganing down the side of the mountain, the slope here, getting to the bottom, tumbling again, flying back up again, and just doing it continuously. It was just a magical thing to see. So there's lots going on there. And uh, I think it's out at this point, I'll just stop, and you don't want to hear me, you want to hear Harvey, and we'll get Chris to introduce Harvey. Thanks very much. Hi everyone, before I introduce Harvey, I've been asked to make a very special mention of Coast Mountain Sports, who are one of the sponsors of the door prizes tonight. So my name's Chris Ryder, as mentioned, I am the executive director of Seapaws Yukon. When Friends of McIntyre Creek invited me to introduce Harvey Locke to, to you tonight, I was feeling pretty privileged. It's because Harvey is one of Canada's preeminent environmentalists and conservationists, and there's not too many in Canada. If you have a think about who the special conservationists are, there's not too many that come to mind, but I can guarantee Harvey will be one of them. It's because he's been involved in many, many successful campaigns to protect wilderness all across Canada. No stranger to the Yukon, Harvey has actually visited us many times before, and he's paddled many of our rivers. 
A world-renowned speaker, he's given keynote presentations at parks and wilderness conferences around the globe, and he's spoken in front of presidents and world leaders. When I was speaking to him last night, though, he was telling me about probably the, uh, the greatest privilege he had, which was to address the large crowds assembled at the Faro Sheep and Crane Festival in 2011. <laughs> Named as one of Canada's leaders for the 21st century by Time magazine, Harvey has been recognized with a number of awards for his work, including the Friend M. Packard International Parks Merit Award, that's a mouthful, and the Queen Elizabeth II Diamond Jubilee Medal. In 1993, Harvey created Yellowstone to Yukon, a vision to create a series of parks, starting with the Peel Watershed in the north, heading down to uh, Yellowstone in the south. It's an idea that was so controversial and so dangerous that Premier Pazlowski once described it as, um, if we achieve it, Yukon as we know it today will cease to exist. <laughs> More recently, Harvey has been leading the Nature Needs Half movement, and it's this topic that he'll be discussing for you tonight. Um, at the end of this, we'll have a chance to ask Harvey some questions, and so I just wanted to let everyone know there will be an opportunity for a Q&A, Q &A. and with that, I would like to uh, welcome Harvey Luck to the stage. That's very nice, thank you. Hello, everyone. To make sure my computer boots up here. Is it sleeping now? Oh, well. We'll make it work. Um, Yes, how great. Um, I'm really thrilled to be here. Thank you all for coming out. Had a glorious day today, as Michael said. He, uh, we had a chance to fly up McIntyre Creek, and we came up uh, close and personal to a bald eagle flying right in front of a helicopter. And if you've never had that, it really focuses the mind. <clears throat> it was quite a remarkable experience. Uh, but this is a grand experience for me to be among you, and I wanted to try to go on a kind of a personal journey with you tonight because I, uh, I've had some special experiences in my life uh, in this territory, in this part of the world, and it's actually had a pretty big impact on my thinking and on what I care about. And even today as I was preparing for this talk, um, I found I was really trying hard to say something that I thought rang true to me not just uh, come up with something I'd prepackaged from my home in Banff and brought up to you to, to give a talk about. And I hope uh, the insights that I give you will um, provide some way of thinking about the future of the territory and the future of uh, how we all relate to the world. So the first thing I want to say is thank you, thank you, thank you for bringing me up again. Um, I'm very grateful to the Friends of McIntyre Creek, to Michael Bendel and Celeste Sundquist Bendel for having us in their beautiful home on McIntyre Creek where we watch bald eagles and foxes and things like that. And my wife, Mary of Marchand, who's helped me get organized and all of the sponsors who are recognized, including many friends, I'm grateful to you for that. And I also want to pay my respects to the Tan Quachan and the Kwanlan Dun people for having us here in the territory. So without further ado, I want to take you to uh, a cedar of Lebanon. Now, this is one of the most degraded environments on earth. And it goes back to the epic of Gilgamesh, a fight over whether or not they were going to deforest that. So way even before the, the Bible of the Judeo-Christian tradition. I was there last week. And it's fascinating to see this wonderful tree, and then you see there's little bits of trees that are being reforested. But this area has been degraded for thousands of years. And as one who loves nature, it's, it's a hard thing to see. And what's so interesting about uh, the north here is I first experienced what real wilderness is in this landscape. When I worked on the Tatshenshini campaign some years ago, we went down the Tatshenshini. And I remember just going, wow, this is totally different. It's the opposite end of the scale from from this. And I then paddled the peel, uh, particularly um, we paddled uh, the Snake River uh, about 25 years ago or so. And I remember this feeling, the bear tracks and the wolf tracks and uh, what I now understand to be a gravel bed river 
were normal. And I remember we seeing caribou dancing through the willows as we were paddling down the river. And these experiences really did mark me. And they made me think about the world in a different way. Uh, and they made me think about the world as it was and as it could be. And another place of the north that's had a, a really big impact on me is the Nahani. And in particular, uh, I worked very hard on that Nahani campaign, and Neil Hartling, who's here, worked on it as well very strenuously. And I learned about this deep, deep connection that indigenous people in this part of the world still hold to the land and how deeply it is embedded in the stories and worldview. And this is Rabbit Kettle Hot Springs in the Nahani. And it is a place where Jamba Jeja or Yomoria gave them their laws. So if you're from the Judeo-Christian tradition, this is Mount Sinai for the Decho Dene people. And that kind of deep connection to place is something that hasn't been severed in all places. And it's, it was very powerful to, to feel that. And so I want to take you on a little journey that begins with... Uh, where I come from, and brings us back here in the end. And This is where I live. Uh, I live in Banff, um, and that's the place where my ancestors are from. Um, my family were the first white people in southern Alberta, and it was called the Northwest Territories when they arrived. So it gives you a sense. There were no Mounties yet, no train yet, and they lived among the stony people in between what is now Calgary and Banff. And the creek on the left there is named Brewster Creek for my great-grandfather, and my mother's uh, in that picture in her ashes and so on. My great-grandparents are in the graveyard there. Um, this is deeply home for me, and it affected me very much as I was growing up um, that we had these beautiful wild places. It's also the world's third oldest national park. It's also a World Heritage Site, and it's actually the image of Canada in the world. I don't know if you've seen that research, but this is actually what people think of when they think of Canada. Not, curiously enough, Toronto. Um, and this is a marvelous painting by a man named Charlie Russell, a famous Montana artist. It's called When the Land Belonged to God. And this is the, when the great herds of bison were on the prairies. In the millions. Estimates 30 to 50 million bison were on the Great Plains. When my great-grandfather came across they were still there. When my great-grandmother came up the Missouri River by steamboat to Fort Benton, Montana to go up into southern Alberta, because that's how people did it then, they had to stop the steamboat for seven hours for the buffalo herd to cross the Missouri River. Okay, so my mother knew this woman, and I grew up hearing these stories about that's what the world was like in not so long ago memory. We're talking 140 years. And yet, 30 to 50 million bison present in the early part of the 1800s, down to about 64 animals by about 1880. An astonishing slaughter, just at the scale of calamity that's hard to imagine. Uh, my family ate buffalo at first when they came out, and now, of course, we're down to not so many. And what happened? And what happened is, is actually a story... Uh, of how we see the world. And that's how I really want to spend some time with you. This painting is called American Progress, or Progress as we Canadians would pronounce it. And it's an image that was in a book about how to go west that was available in New York. And what's interesting about it is it's a painting by a man named John Gast. And it was done this way because it also was there to serve illiterate people. So you could take this out of the book and look at it. And it told the whole story. So if you see, the, there's liberty. She rep represents progress. And in her hand is the telegraph line, and you see a book of knowledge. And behind her comes the trains, the plows, the miners, the settlers in the wagon. Progress comes west from the big cities, and before her flee wildness. The wolves are being chased out of the landscape, the indigenous people are being chased out of the landscape, and the bison are being chased out of the landscape. And this is the mental picture of progress that was present in the 19th century. And if you can imagine her being somewhat more portly and a little bit less smiley, that's Queen Victoria, right? That's, that's what happened in Canada, happened in Australia, happened in South Africa. Um, same thing. This idea of transforming the world in the name of progress and getting rid of the wildness was extremely powerful, and it was something our society was heavily engaged in. 
Um, but that idea of progress ran into another idea that was current at the time that was a counter-reaction to industrialization and to child labor in mines and to filthy cities that came with the Industrial Revolution, and that was the idea of romanticism. And the romantic movement said that nature is beautiful and that wildness is beautiful, and those two ideas collided at a place called Yellowstone. And in 1872, the world's first national park was created in Yellowstone. And it was created because it was beautiful. It was created because it was wild. It was created because people thought, in this case, progress meant leaving it alone. And so we came to this place in Western North America of national parks like Yellowstone, and Banff would soon follow, and transformation of the landscape too. And we basically achieved a, what you might call a, a reconciliation of sorts where we de designated certain areas of the landscape as green boxes and said that's where we'll have nature because we like nature and then we'll have the rest of the landscape for progress. And that was the case uh, that sort of that settled in in the last century, in the 20th century is sort of the way we do things in North America. We have our nature in green boxes and progress on the rest of the landscape. Now if we go forward a little bit, there's where we've done protected areas. And we've done pretty well. Um, there's some big ones. You can see down in the middle of the big yellow one is Yellowstone. Um, the Banff and Jasper, which I bet everybody in this room has driven through Banff and Jasper. Is there anybody who hasn't? Yeah, not too many. Um, so you know where that is. Um, and you can see most of the large parks are concentrated in the west, which makes sense because that's when the sort of settlement occurred and these other ideas emerged. And they've been really, really important. And in fact, if we look at where large mammals survive in North America, the correlation between where the parks are and where the large mammals are is astonishing. So, excuse me, this is a map of 14 carnivores and ungulates, so think big horns and big teeth, um, animals that, that are large. Um, where they were in historic times on the left, you see all the hot colors, 14 species is bright red, white is zero species. And you can see there were, for example, in the Great Lakes, there were a lot of large mammals. There was actually buffalo in Buffalo, New York, that's why they call it that. Um, and there were elk, and there were wolves, and there was caribou in, in southern Quebec and so on. Um, and then you can see what happened after the progress. And you can see there's places with zero. And those places with zero are the big, uh, heavily farmed areas where there aren't any of these large mammals left. So the tall grass prairie going up into Manitoba, the big corn belt in the United States, Ohio River Valley. And you can see dark green is just one. So think a deer. And, but where are the colors still hot? I'll go back. Look where the big parks are. That's where the colors are still hot. And they're also still hot up in the north. And that's mostly not by design. That's because we hadn't quite gotten there yet. And I'm going to spend some time talking about that. And if you go to other continents and you ask, where are there elephants today? Where there are elephants today is where there are nature reserves in Africa. That's where there are elephants, and those are the parks of Africa. If you ask the same question about lions, that's where lions were in red, and that's where they are in blue. Remember that park map I just showed of Africa. And the one surviving Asiatic lion population is the National Park in Gujarat, India, that little blue dot. So these things have been phenomenally successful to keep wild animals alive in the face of otherwise overwhelming pressures that eliminate them. Tigers. Where there's nature reserves, there's tigers. Where there's no nature reserves, there are very few tigers. Same with orangutans. So we know that we've done a good job by creating places for these things to live. Uh, in fact, parks and wilderness protected areas are the foundation of nature conservation all over the world. They are the single most effective thing we know how to do. They really, really work when they're well-managed. But there's a challenge 
with the green box idea. This is a map of Yellowstone, which you can see is the original one, and it's truly a square box. Is as good as parks and wilderness areas are, they are the foundation, they are the indispensable prerequisite, they are the building block, they are not adequate to save nature at scale. And the grizzly bear taught us this. So the grizzly bear's distribution, if you think of that first map of North America where the animals were all over the landscape, they were down into Mexico, the grizzly bears, they were in the middle of the prairies, they were of course up here. And uh, That's that tan color on this map. So think of that as when liberty starts out. Red is where they are today. But the really interesting color on this map is the coffee bean color. You see the little coffee beans there? That's where bears were in 1922. And every one of those little island populations of bears has gone extinct since then. And they go extinct because they don't have enough numbers. There are too few in their numbers. They don't have a viable population if they're on a small habitat island. And if something happens like a fire or a disease or poaching or something, they just disappear. And the only island of grizzly bears left right now of any size is Yellowstone. And then you can see there's a kind of a peninsula that runs down the Canadian Rockies through Banff and Jasper down to Waterton Glacier, if you know where that is, the Montana Alberta border, of bears. And then it gets wilder as you go north. And those bears in Yellowstone will go extinct if we can't reconnect it up. And to give you an idea of scale, you see the, the red blob that's Yellowstone, there's the biggest blob to the left. That's two million hectares of wilderness, and it wasn't big enough to hold on to bears. It's called the Selway Bitterroot area of Idaho. They really do need big systems because they have low reproductive rates, they live at low densities, and they need a lot of space. So all of this understanding of nature needing connections, not just islands, but connections, they have to be connected, uh, led to the creation of uh, the idea of large landscape conservation, which is you think about viable populations, you think about connections among them, you think about having core protected areas, parks, and so on, and you think about how across the landscape that works so that the animals can move even when there's people in the landscape. And you try to call all of that large landscape conservation, and that allows species to adapt to things like climate change and to move around the landscape. This is sort of the big idea of large landscape conservation. And I'll take you through why that exists a little bit. So the idea of large, this is a park created in Boston called Middlesex Fells Reservation, created um, in the 1890s. And when I lived in Boston, I actually looked up the history of it, and it was created to protect wilderness, in particular plants. And it was surrounded by farms at the time it was created. It was a rocky outcrop. So think of maybe something like McIntyre Creek being protected today, and there not being any houses around it. And then you can see what's happened. This is a recent photo. The yellow is now city, and it's been completely encircled. But it's been managed as a park for over 100 years. And what's happened is, because Boston had a lot of universities in the 19th century, in the 1890s when it was established, people went in and inventoried the plant species, the native plants there. And they found there was something in the order of 300 native plants and 17 weeds or exotic species. Somebody got the idea to go back and say, well, now that it's become an island and a city, what does that mean? And they went in 100 years later and they found out that several species were disappearing, plant species. And the ones that had disappeared were things like the, the lily that are bulb reproducing species or the burr reproducing species. You know how burrs stick to fur? Because there was no fur moving in and out anymore. And if something happened to these bulb reproducing species, they were isolated from other populations of plants and they just simply couldn't come back. But the things that were still reproducing so they were down to 230 native species and 70 exotics. The things that were reproducing were the things that were still windborne, that were connected by the air or pollinators. So the connectivity of that place really, really mattered a lot to its well-being. If you scale up a little bit, this is Point Pelee National Park in southern Ontario. It's been protected for over 100 years. Behind the flag, is a lovely area of Carolinian forest, hugely important for migratory birds, monarch butterflies, really cool place. And on this side is where all the tomato ketchup in the world comes from, practically. So big tomato fields. Pesticides, herbicides, and then this kind of ratty development on the entrance. 
what's happened to Point Pelee National Park, which is several times bigger than Middlesex Fells. Well, this is amphibians. So historically, these 11 species were there, mud puppies, toads, frogs. By 1972, three of them were gone. By 1994, over half of them were gone. Even though it had been a park the whole time. Because it wasn't in an environment that was big enough to allow those things to recover if something happened to them and the environment around them was not successful for them to live in. In fact, this is the consequence of no large protected areas. This is a map of the crisis ecoregions of the world. This is where all the endangered species in the world are concentrated. And it corresponds to where there are no large protected areas. An amazing relationship between where things are disappearing and where we don't protect nature. The next big idea is how do you keep a viable population? If you know that small is a problem, what do you do to make them viable? Well, one of the ideas that emerged, and we pioneered a lot of this stuff through the Yellowstone to Yukon idea because we had an iconic landscape. There are a lot of researchers doing a lot of good work. And we came upon this idea of the umbrella species using the grizzly bear. And the idea of the grizzly bear as an umbrella species is if you can keep it in the landscape, the chances are you can keep about 85% of all the other species in the landscape because it lives at a low reproductive rate, uh, it moves around, it's a generalist, and people aren't very tolerant of it. So if you can keep them alive, you can keep about 85% of other things alive as an indicator. So that's called an umbrella, the idea that other things come underneath it. So you'll remember this map that I showed you of how the bears over time have uh, fared. So how do we know how the bears are doing? Well, there's this amazing thing called radio collaring uh, where somebody puts a dart in the bear's shoulder. Do you see the red dart in the bear's shoulder? And the bear didn't like it, so he's beating up the tree. Um, and this fellow in the foreground is a research biologist named Mike Proctor, who's a, um, a good colleague, a good friend. And that bear eventually went to sleep after I took this photo, and we all got up very nervously and got near the bear and watched as they put the collar on and put the oxygen in. This is what they do. They take great care to make sure it's healthy. They mark the ear. And then that big white thing is a radio collar that tells them how the bears walk around the landscape. Um, and that work and the work of a bunch of other bear biologists from the southern part of the Yellowstone to Yukon region was all pooled in this fantastic scientific paper called the monograph, Proctor et al. And they actually have a census of the number of bears uh, from about 2012, where they are in the system. And so you see the Yellowstone Island, 571 bears. Of course, it's up and down a little bit, but not very much. Um, the, you have, uh, in the Banff area, you see only 90 bears, but the, the Banff area is connected to other bigger populations. Um, and you see these dotted lines? Those dotted lines in every case correspond to a gravel bed river, a highway, human settlements, and often rail lines. And those dotted lines are where the population's starting to break up into fragments, according to the genetic research. So something is going on there, that, or the females aren't able to move through the landscape. And you can see the challenge of fragmentation, as it's called, breaking up the landscape even further. So this is Proctor and a land trust fellow um, named Rob Neal from the Nature Trust of BC identifying the parcels where the bears move across those roads and those low elevation valley bottoms where lakes are with a view to uh, buying those parcels, which are the little purple areas on this map. That's the map of where the bears are in gray. And the little purple areas is a program that we've been doing through Yellowstone to Yukon to buy the parcels of land where the bears are actually still crossing. And what's really amazing is that's all there is where they're still crossing in some of those places. So it hangs together by these threads. And so even if you want to think at the scale of Yellowstone to Yukon, sometime it'll come down to an 80-acre parcel of land on a highway so the bears can keep moving through and keep genetic exchanges. And of course, another thing that was pioneered in this part of the world was the highway crossing structures. Many of you will have driven through these in Banff wondered how well they work. They're wildly successful. They were an experiment, but they've turned out really, really well. They're being used by bears. They were used by smaller animals. There's been 100, over 150,000, 200,000 wildlife crossings through the system 
The fence keeps the animals on the road and funnels them into these structures. It's now a world famous project. There's a bear on top of one. And the consequence of all of this big thinking, thinking at the scale of Yellowstone to Yukon, how we pull it all together, has an aggregate of activities has resulted in a lot more conservation across the landscape. It's quite encouraging. If you look at before and after, people starting to think in their heads about how the landscape connects, how it works, how we can protect more of it, you start to get um, a more meaningful level from left to right over a period of 20 plus years. And we've learned something really important that I didn't know when we started and it came out of this work. There are places that aren't yet protected that are really critical to protect. One of those is the Flathead Valley of British Columbia, which is just outside of Waterton Glacier Peace Park. And it's super fantastic low elevation valley bottom. No human settlement in it, even though it's just on the American border. Has the densest population of grizzly bears in the interior of North America. Has high, high concentration of birds, has the highest that system has the highest vascular plant diversity population in Canada. Um, there, there are almost no exotic species in this valley. It's an amazing place. And I've had the privilege of going there a lot. And I took this photograph from the air when I was with a fellow named Rick Hauer, who's a limnologist. And uh, we were working uh, with a film crew trying to protect this place and so on. And if you look down at the river, can, can anybody see the river in that picture? Okay. Now, my guess is this is what you're thinking about. How am I doing? So the reality is the river is actually from here way over to there, to the far bank. That whole thing is the river. And what do I mean by that? Well, there's actually water moving through that whole thing. And these gravel bed rivers we have in glaciated mountain landscapes in North America um, and elsewhere, the system is very different than we think of it. This is it kind of revealed. So this is a, a park um, called Weaselhead Park in Calgary. And it's the slack water of a reservoir that has revealed actually what's going on below the surface in the river system. So you can see the river but actually, this is the gravel bed floodplain from there right to the other trees on the other side. And then you can see what everything is going on underneath that vegetation normally. That whole thing is going to move around, is going to flow through, and that whole wide system is the river, not just the channel. And we think of rivers as rain gutters, where sometimes there's no water in it, sometimes it's too full and it's naughty and it spills out and we call that a flood. We should actually be thinking of them as sponges with a line traced across the top. And that line actually will wander around from time to time. It doesn't stay in its channel in these systems. And you can see the old channels. If you look carefully at that photo, you can see the old lines. That's where the channels were on the river. And I'm sure some of you are going through your Rolodex in your head saying, I've seen this, I've seen this. This is actually what the river looks like. So the river channel is the dark blue. Under the river gravels, if you stood on river gravels at the bottom of the Yukon River here in town, you stood there, there would be water running under your feet under those gravels. And, you, and beside you in the gravels, there would be water running. There's probably water running under most of downtown Whitehorse right now. And there's w water that's moving through time as well. So as well as it going down and going sideways, which is two dimensions, it's very different through time. It's very different in the spring than it is in the winter than it is in the summer, than it is in the fall. And it's also um, longitudinal. It starts somewhere and goes somewhere. And these four dimensions actually make the whole river floodplain the most active place and the most ecologically significant part of the entire landscape. And the, the work on that is kind of amazing. From, this goes from bugs. So um, if you could imagine... Uh, is there anybody a fisher person here? You know what a caddisfly or a mayfly is? Those things actually will swim through the gravels in that hyperreic zone um, in order to pass part of their lives as they mature. And then they'll swim back to the gravels and release in the channel and turn into the bugs that you know and get fed on by birds. If you drilled a well um, hard enough in downtown Whitehorse and started pumping hard, you could actually see the water level go down in the river. 
This whole thing is connected. And that's the place where the most important part of the landscape for everything from grizzly bears um, through to caribou, through to wolves, through to birds, through to tr um, trees, to insects, and why? This is the Flathead River where a lot of this stuff was discovered. You'll recognize rivers like this in Yukon. Um, Yukon's full of these rivers. These gravels are, represent this huge amount of ecological secession. So this is a new surface scoured by a flood, as we call it, but it's really a flood is just there's more water in the sponge than when there isn't. And the flood is just when the sponge is so full that the water's running on top. Uh, on the left, those are 200-year-old trees. So you have a brand new surface, an intermediate surface with the willows, and then an old surface there. And then when the river changes channel, this will become an old surface and that'll be a new surface. And that dynamism creates a really highly productive environment that actually drives the productivity for the whole landscape. And what's fascinating about this, we actually didn't know this until about five years ago, that it worked across all taxa. And when Mike Proctor, that bear biologist, first started thinking about it, he said, my goodness, after we examine all my data, because that actually is true for grizzly bears, the limiting factor for grizzly bears is these gravel bed river floodplains. And Mark Hebelwhite, who's a famous wolf um, ungulate ecologist researcher said, I have to reevaluate all my data. That's actually where most predation occurs and most wolf dens occur on the edge of gravel bed river floodplains. It's quite astonishing how important it is to the whole function of the place. And then there's this other weird phenomenon. Um, this is the Bull River in Banff National Park. How many of you have wondered why the river runs open when it's 40 below in Whitehorse? Like, why doesn't it freeze? And it's not because it's moving. It's because it freezes where it's moving elsewhere, right? So the moving thing doesn't work. And what's happening is actually there's, uh, in those gravels that are under your feet, the water goes down, goes under the river, and then it comes back up. So in the winter, that's actually winter warmed because it comes to the surface warm. And you can see above the, uh, below the ice there, this stretch is open, doesn't matter how cold it gets because it's actually the return area. And similarly in the summer, that's summer cooled. That's where the trout and things can live because the water's gone down in the gravels, it isn't heating up, it comes to the surface, and that's where the, the fish that like cold water can live. All of that is dependent on us not monkeying with the gravel, not monkeying with the process, not controlling floods, because the key to the system is the water pulsing through in what we call a flood season that actually rolls the gravels and opens them. And if you stop floods, the gravels lock up like a cobblestone street. There's no place for the bugs to go. There's no place for that water to move up and down. And the thing seals shut and starts to die. And this was shown by one of the co-authors on this paper, a man named Stu Rood, below the St. Mary's Dam in Waterton Park, on the edge of Waterton Park. Uh, all the cottonwood trees died after about 70 years. They couldn't figure out why. And the reason why was because the trees put their seeds in, in flood soils. And if there's no flood, there's no place for the seeds to go. And they say, okay, well, you fix that, put some you know, flood sediments down, and then reduce the water level. But that actually doesn't work because the cottonwood seeds are evolved to actually chase the water level as it goes down through the gravels. They actually follow that as the water naturally recedes, and that's how cottonwood trees regenerate. So it's kind of an amazing thing to learn in the 2010s about the rivers that we all live with. And it turns out that the limiting factor for bears, as I mentioned, is they're all trying to cross valley bottoms. And in this case, there was only one place where all these bears with these data, each, all these lines coming together could cross at a place called Duck Lake. And what we noticed is at this place called Duck Lake, there's the river, there's some farms, and that's the only place connecting the Selkirk and Purcell grizzly bears in the southern part of the region. Just this one area. Everything else has been disrupted. Now, you figure all this great stuff out, you figure out protected areas work, you figure out, you try to connect it all up across the landscape, and you think, oh, we're doing pretty well, and then along comes climate change. And some people have suggested there might be something like a rug being pulled out from under the view. If you have your protected area here, but the climate moves, everything that lives in that area will be left high and dry. So the rug's pulled out from under you, and your protected area is of no value. That's a fear, that's a concern. Um, and here's kind of the issue. Um, 
This is a historical photo from 1906 of Kootenai National Park, Banff Park in the background. And you can see the tree line there in the foreground, right there. And this is a repeat photography project by a guy uh, named Will Rausch, a friend of mine. And there's the tree line now. You see how it's gone way up the slope? And if it continues to grow up the slope, it'll go right to the mountaintop. And you'll no doubt, if you've had a lot of experience out in the landscape here, will have noticed the tree line is rising up here as well. That's a real concern for a species like the pika, because they live, uh, they can't handle temperatures above 26 Celsius. And they live in rock piles at the top of mountains. And if that gets invaded by trees and warms up, they just disappear. And in fact, um, that's the pika populations in the western U.S. And something like 16 of them have gone extinct because of this effect of just being squeezed off the top of the mountain by the heat. But the good news is, in, in, uh, for many species, the protected areas in the landscape actually are serving as stepping stones. They're moving between them. Even in places as crowded and fragmented as England, that's where the study comes from. And what species will do as the climate warms is they'll go north, they'll go upslope, or they'll go around aspect. And I don't know if you know what aspect is, but if you went to McIntyre Creek today, you'd see the south-facing slope is bare grass, and the north-facing slope has still got three feet of snow on it. And that's called aspect, because that's very different climate conditions within 100 yards of each other because of the angle of the sun at our latitude. And that's what species will do to adapt, but the more landscape they have to adapt in it, the better they will do. And in the case of the little pika, the good news is in our part of the world, tree line is very, very low relative to the alpine, so they can do well as long as we maintain valley bottom to mountain top, and we also maintain enough of the landscape they can go around behind where it's wetter as opposed to dry, and then we retain this north-south connectivity. This is the Rocky Mountain Trench which runs from Montana right up to the Liard, has a little picnic, and then starts again in the Tintinna Trench, if you know where the Tintinna Trench is, where Ross River is. It's, it's one of the great valleys in the world. You hear the African Rift Valley? Well, the Rocky Mountain Trench and Tintinna Trench is one of the great valley systems of the world. It never varies in elevation more than 300 meters. And phenomenally important wetlands, flyways, and for wildlife. Um, so we've learned this that if we want to save nature, we have to think big. And we've moved from the archetype of the park as an island to networks, connectivity for climate adaptation, for wildlife, and everything. Um, so how much of the world have we protected? How big have we been thinking? Well, this is some data. We've protected roughly 15, 16% of the Earth's surface and about 5% of the oceans. It's up a little bit lately because some things have happened in oceans that are good. So, is that enough? Some, right now, around 12.7% of Yukon territory is protected. So, less than the global average, but still some. Well, if we look at a map of the world's ecoregions, this is where vegetation is assembled in particular patterns. There's 846 of these different vegetation assemblies around the world. And people have begun asking the question, how much do you need to protect to maintain all of life in those systems? And this is called ecoregional planning, and they follow some goals, such as representing each one of these 846 regions and the other features that are unique, how animals move around the landscape, resilience, keeping natural processes like flooding, and they've, so in the case of the Canadian Rockies ecoregion, which is down around Banff and Waterton, where I'm from, which is, you can see, is a dark green area on the map, the study that was done with a whole bunch of experts said, well, you'd need to protect 49.7% of that region if you wanted to ensure that everything that lived there naturally stayed alive. Um, and we didn't, they didn't deal with connectivity or range shifts on account of the climate. Just, there you are, roughly half. Um, these are st other studies from around the United States that were done around the same time, and you see from a low of 26% to a high of 70%, the sort of middle range is around half. That's how much you need to protect if you want to maintain all of nature.
This is a study from Cape Floristic region in South Africa. If you've ever seen a jade plant, it came from here. It's all these weird plants. It's one of the rare plant kingdoms in the world. And there's a marvelous national park in the middle of Cape Town, the city. And this, is, this photograph I took up there, these giant proteas, really weird, cool stuff. The study done in that part of the world by South African scientists and Australians, you would need to protect 52% of that region if you wanted to keep everything alive that naturally belongs there. This is a tiger in the Western Ghats in India. And there, India even has wild places, really good wild places actually. It's quite remarkable because they're very tolerant of wildlife in India. Um, their study said if you wanted to maintain all the wildlife in the Western Ghats area, which is where black pepper comes from originally and cool things like that, you'd need to protect about 60% of it in an interconnected way. And the, some of the great thinking done in our part of the world led by indigenous people is the idea of protecting roughly half of the Decho territory or roughly two-thirds of the Peel watershed coming from traditional knowledge and awareness of how the landscape works. Another knowledge system, not using the scientific principles, using knowledge gained from many years of observation and living with stuff, coming in at the same level. In fact, Herb Norwegian, the Grand Chief of the Decho Dene, said at the World Wilderness Congress in Alaska, I believe every First Nation should advocate to protect at least half of their territory. So that led us to create an idea called Nature Needs Half. The idea of protecting at least half the world in an interconnected way. And to just come out and say it. And you know, the current tar conservation target for Canada, does anybody know what it is? Seventeen. Seventeen percent protected for Canada in the land and ten percent in the oceans. And where that came from is a global treaty called the Convention on Biodiversity. You know where Canada is right now? Under 12% of protected land. And so there's a big gap between where we are and where we need to be if, and only if, you want to hang on to nature. If you don't want to hang on to nature, then you don't care. If you do want to hang on to nature, you should care a lot because this is what the, the facts are, so to speak. And how feasible is it to protect half the world? Well, if you look at the world's ecoregions, 12% of them already are at least half protected. In another 64%, which is two-thirds of them, it's very feasible to imagine protecting half of the system. And in 24%, you can't get there. You would have to do restoration. It would be a very long process. Um, and an example of that would be southwestern Ontario, if you've ever been there. Uh, there's nowhere you can protect half of that for a very long time to come because it's all tomato fields, tobacco farms, and cities. But there's fragments of it that are still very valuable, but that's where most of Canada's endangered species are concentrated, of course. Now, who's done a great job in the world? This is Bhutan. Bhutan is a Himalayan kingdom. It's really interesting because it's basically run by indigenous people. The Bhutanese are still, uh, they're Buddhists, but they're also animists. And they openly talk about their animistic bond heritage and the worldview of a Bon person is very similar to the worldview of an indigenous person from North America, a traditional indigenous person. The idea that you share the world with the rest of life, that animals have spirits, that the forest has spirits, the rocks are alive. All of that similar worldview is held by the Bhutanese. So the Bhutanese, as part of their vision of gross national happiness, have actually protected half of their country in an interconnected way. And it's an astonishing system goes from 80 meters of an elevation up to over 7,000 meters. They've got tigers and snow leopards that have been photographed on the same camera trap in the Himalayas. I've been there twice in the last two years checking it out. It's an amazing, it's real. It's not on paper. It's an amazing thing. And it just comes because their culture is committed to saving nature. And they're also experiencing rapid development. They're doing pretty darn well on the development indices compared to where they were. But they've made a commitment to saving nature. This is a study done by a Chinese scholar on China. Would it be possible to protect half of China? And the answer is it would, but you have to kind of look at the different conditions. There's sort of three conditions there. There's the big wild Tibetan plateau in blue. There's the dark green is where there's a lot of stuff you could cobble together. And the white stuff is where all the farms and all the people are. 
and you're going to be looking at the ability to do a lot less in those zones. Um, if you look at Europe, you can see that parts of Europe, it's very challenging to do stuff, but in the north and along the mountain ranges, you could actually cobble stuff together at scale. If you look at Brazil, Brazil has actually protected half of Brazil already. Half the Amazon has been protected. Um, they're working on a restoration project. You can see they're really equivalent to southern Ontario as what's called the Mad Atlantica Forest, where Rio de Janeiro and Sao Paulo are. That's the dark green on the coast. And you can see the little fragments. They're consciously stitching them back together now. And in between is an area called the Pantanal and the Sahado, where it is quite possible to protect half of it in an interconnected way. Um, so this is something that sort of emerged, is that the world is really in three conditions when it comes to nature conservation. You've got your really crowded, fertile, farmed, urbanized, endangered species or concentrated places. You've got your in-between places where you have kind of the open landscape that you can imagine connecting stuff up, like what I was talking about in the southern end of the Yellowstone Yukon region where they're fragments, but you can link them together. And then you've got the big wild places. And the big wild places are roadless, um, they, you can imagine big, vast systems, and those big wild places are actually disproportionately significant to how the world functions, not just for the animals that live there, but for the whole functioning of the planet. And I'm going to take you into that idea, because that actually transcends worrying about what lives there to thinking about where we all live. So those big wild places are the blue places on this map. Amazon... Um, the, the tropical savanna of northern Australia, northern Canada, where we are now, or not exactly where we are now, but in this region. Um, these are so the remaining big wild places on planet Earth. And how do we think about conservation there? Well, half the Amazon is protected between indigenous areas and things like national parks. You hear about the Amazons and all this trouble and they're not doing enough? You know how much of the Mackenzie Basin, which is equivalent for us, is protected? about 14%. That's where the oil sands are, all that. Brazilians are doing a far better job of this than we are. And yet we hear about what they're not doing. Their challenges are all in the south, creeping in from the south as roads expand. But much of the Amazon is an incredibly wild and fantastic condition. And that's a good thing. Because there's this phenomenon of rainfall in Brazil that's actually dependent on the forest. So that's the first rainfall that comes off the ocean into the Amazon. It's like what happens over here on the west coast. You know, the water comes off the ocean and falls as rain, right? We all know that. But in the Amazon, what happens next is amazing. This is the Amazon forest viewed, photographed this from the top of a tower in a big unbroken part of the Amazon. The rain is actually coming out of the trees. There's little particulate organic matter that comes out of the trees, goes up into the humid sky, particularizes, and rolls westward and falls again with the wind. And that happens actually multiple times across the Amazon. Not driven by the ocean, driven by the forest. And the estimates are that if there's less than 80% forest cover, that will stop. If that stops, it flips to a savanna because it's dry. Then all of the, the, the things going on there associated with that rainfall that includes the rainfall that waters the crops in the middle of the United States comes from there. It actually affects the whole world if we lose more than 20% of the forest cover of the Amazon. Where are we now? about 18% of the forest cover of the Amazon has been lost. So a target of half in this circumstances would be far too little. We actually need to be thinking about keeping intact about 80% of the Amazon because otherwise it won't be the Amazon anymore. Here's another thing to think about that's really important. Um, did you know that about a quarter of all the carbon emissions that make the climate change in the world come from disturbing nature. That's more than every car in the world and every airplane in the world. 
They come from disturbing the carbon in nature, burning it or disturbing peat bogs. Um, that's actually causing more CO2 in the atmosphere than many of the things you would identify as the problem. This is because all this soil is, there, there's carbon stored in trees in the tropics, you might have heard of that. But in the higher latitudes, it's all stored in the soil. And the two of the greatest soil repositories on Earth are the James Bay, Hudson Bay Lowlands and the Mackenzie Basin here in Canada's north, which wraps around into the Peel watershed. And that's because there's all this soil there full of carbon. And there's one calculation that the soil in the James Bay area full of carbon actually cools the climate by one degree Celsius right now. Remember, our objective is to keep climate change below two degrees change. So disturbing that is to release that to the atmosphere. If we change the water balance in that peat by disturbing it, even with roads and other things, then that carbon can be released to the atmosphere. So nature conservation and climate change are actually kind of linked, like the yin and yang idea. It's not climate change is more important than nature conservation. They both are essential as we go forward in the world. You can't privilege one over the other. We have to do both, which just makes sense. So I'm sorry this is a bit fuzzy, but I want to take you to one of the wickedest conservation problems in the world, caribou. Okay, this is, you remember that map about where large mammals were in North America and where they are? The black dotted line is where caribou were 150 years ago. The various colors are where the different subspecies or species like woodland caribou, um, tundric populations, and so on are. Um, one population has gone extinct. It was the one that was on the Queen Charlotte Islands. Um, island populations have trouble, as we know, when you disturb their habitat. What's really astonishing is you see the creep back up the mountains. You see the little Selkirk population in the U.S.? There was a big news story last week. There's three of them left. And they're just the walking dead. They'll be gone. That's going to go extinct. And you see the fragments down in the, in the Banff Jasper area, the orange? Banff Park, even though it's protected all of its caribou habitat, lost all of its caribou in an avalanche about 15 years ago. And it's because the rest of the landscape was so fragmented and hostile that it didn't matter that that part of it was protected. So do you know what the Environment Canada studies show about if you want to maintain woodland caribou in Canada, all that orange stuff? You have to maintain 65% of the habitat intact. Intact. Not chopped up, not sustainably managed, not happy logging, intact. If you want to maintain caribou. And of course, look at Alberta there, how Alberta's just gone at its landscape. And one of the things that's really vexing to me as somebody from Alberta is if the model is that someday Yukon will be successful because it's like Alberta, um, then you will lose all the wild character of your landscape. In Alberta, we have two areas that have stayed wild, the Rocky Mountains, which is one of the great protected areas complexes in the world, and Wood Buffalo National Park. And the Wood Buffalo Park is there because it's on the Canadian Shield and it isn't interesting for oil and gas. But the rest, the bowling alley in the middle, has been slaughtered from a nature point of view. And that's what progress looks like if it continues to come northward. And look how it's coming north. And notice the caribou in the southern Yukon. See how it's breaking up into islands? Yellow islands? You've got a robust population in the Mackenzie Mountains, and of course there's a, I think there's an issue about the caribou and the porcupine caribou herd. Has anybody heard of that? Um, you protect it on one side of the border, but if the neighbors don't, you've got a problem. Um, in fact, there's a really interesting story there because while we've made a national park on our side, the Americans are our National Wildlife Refuge, was never, there was never a full commitment made to protect it. There was a political deal done that says, we, we can only drill there if a majority of Congress allows us to drill there. So they didn't say it was off limits to drilling, they said, you can have a vote. And so you remember 15 years ago under George Bush, there was this big push, and now there's a big push under Donald Trump. And that's because if it isn't protected, and a commitment isn't made to protection, you get all this policy stuff, it will disappear over time. 
When we protect stuff, we have to protect it. We have to say it, we have to mean it, and then we have to do it by law. That's why this issue is live on us again today. But if we even forget the Americans and just think about the Canadians, look at Yukon Territory there. And then look at that map of the whole country. You just see the pattern of the carpet being rolled up with development. And you'll remember I talked about the three conditions of the world for nature conservation. Well, this is the three conditions of Canada. It's actually where I developed this idea. And it's the, you can see where the landscape is heavily settled and agricultural. It's pink. That's where all of our endangered species are in the country. Almost all. If you look at purple, the least impacted, there's those two fingers down the Canadian Rockies where we have Banff and Jasper and also the Purcell Wilderness and Wells Gray Park. They still show up. And that's why the animals are still there clinging to life, although the caribou are challenged. And then the green stuff is where we're industrializing the landscape, where we're chopping it into fragments. That's that kind of open landscape of middle Canada. And if you look at where the caribou are and aren't, they just correspond perfectly to this map. And what's really interesting is, let's look up there. You see the bright orange in the Yukon? That's where we are right now. That's White Horse. Zeroing in on Yukon, there's actually that kind of open, fragmented landscape is actually going on in Yukon right now. This is not just one big wild place. This is a place that's being subjected to huge pressures on the landscape, just as occurred elsewhere. And that's why the caribou distribution maps will show holes in the Yukon when they used to be everywhere. So there's really two Yukons. There's the big wild Yukon, and there's the uh, large landscape conservation place of Yukon. So the conditions that I was describing that we're dealing with down in the south of trying to connect and protect and restore all that stuff, that's real time here where you live in Whitehorse. But you also have that big wild stuff, that stuff that's rare, the dark blue stuff, the stuff that makes the world go round. That you have as well. And you need two different conservation strategies for that. Um, this is McIntyre Creek photographed this morning from the helicopter. Um, does that look familiar? Something about the river and the floodplain? How you might want to protect all of that? That comes down into Whitehorse. It goes up into the mountains. That's a ribbon of life that feeds out of the broader landscape and down into Yukon River. It's an inspired idea to protect all of that while you still can. Um, I learned that that's all uh, uh, territorial land, not urban land. And that means you could do something like a territorial park there. In Calgary, there's the Fish Creek Provincial Park. It's the second largest urban park in the country. It's in the middle of the city. Fabulous place. It's the floodplain of Fish Creek. It's very analogous to this. That's the vision for the McIntyre Creek protected area. There's Whitehorse. Gee, there's an interesting balance there of roughly half the same landscape. Is that a good thing? Would that put the city out of business? Would it destroy your aspirations to have a high-performing economy? This is Boulder, Colorado, one of the most affluent communities in the United States. They've protected 60% of Boulder County and the city of Boulder. That's what it looks like. It's considered one of the top places to live in the U.S. It's because they saved nature. And Whitehorse is in an interesting place. Uh, I grew up in Calgary. Uh, there was a place north of the university which was out on a piece of bald prairie called Nose Hill. Somebody had the vision of protecting that, a guy named Harvey Buckmaster, actually. They worked like hell to protect it, and there's now a 1,200-acre park. It's completely encircled by the city now. It used to be just out there in the wild, in my memory. Now it's completely encircled. This is the time when you make your decisions to protect places, is when you can and I, that's Whitehorse this morning. That's Boulder. Wouldn't that be fun? You see the vision. And there, of course, is one giant gravel bed river, right? And there's downtown Whitehorse. It's on the floodplain of the gravel bed river called the Yukon River. It's kind of fascinating. Now, if we go back to the areas that, uh, th those areas that are fragmented need to be connected, or I circled them there. 
But the areas that aren't circled are one of the greatest conservation opportunities on planet Earth. And that's where you still have caribou. And if you got caribou, you got it all because they're the hardest things to keep, actually. This, I thank Norman Barrichello for this photo. That is a cool and increasingly rare sight in the Mackenzie Mountains. And you can see in yellow where that population in the Mackenzie Mountains is big and robust. It, it intersects in the Peel fascinatingly with the mountain population and the porcupine caribou herd animals actually get all the way into the Peel watershed and up the Snake River. They interfinger. You can imagine an interconnected population. There still is one. What an amazing opportunity. And this is a quote um, by the chief of the Vuntut Gwich'in First Nation. The caribou and the rivers of the Peel watershed are the lifeblood of this land and of the Gwich'in nation. What's really interesting to me about that is the conservation problem of maintaining caribou and rivers are the two things we also know are most difficult from a Western scientific point of view. So you see these two knowledge systems coming together from different sources, but they come together. And this is a passage that I think is really important. How many of you have heard of the Truth and Reconciliation Committee? Okay, lots. And how many of you know that it's a big public policy objective of Canada to try to achieve reconciliation between people who look like me and the first people of the place? Lots of you. Okay, and many of you might even have heard of the recommendations in the TRC report. But very few people have actually read the accompanying document, which is called Principles. And this quote is in the principles document. And it's buried in the middle of a paragraph, I think, due to a formatting error. But to me, it's one of the most powerful things. Reconciliation between Aboriginal and non-Aboriginal Canadians from an Aboriginal perspective also requires reconciliation with the natural world. If human beings resolve problems between themselves but continue to destroy the natural world, then reconciliation remains incomplete. This is a perspective that as commissioners have, we as commissioners have repeatedly heard that reconciliation will never occur unless we are also reconciled with the earth. So the Peel watershed takes on kind of new meaning when you think of it at the scale. Interestingly, wants to protect a big block of land over half and all the river corridors in some way. Exactly right. Exactly important. Globally significant. Really cool. Hopefully it's going to happen soon. That's a great story. But it's not the only great story. It was mentioned in the kind introduction by Chris that Mary Eve and I were over in Faro for the Sandhill Crane and Fan and Sheep Festival a few years ago, and I spoke at that. That is the Garden of Eden of the North over there, around Ross River, Pharaoh. It's unbelievably productive. It's in the we got off the plane from Banff. It was May 4th. We came to Whitehorse. It was kind of brown. It wasn't quite spring. We drove over there, and the minute we turned the corner and got into that area of the Tintinna Trench, it was in the same condition as Banff. Spring, the birds were there. We saw 5,000 cranes go overhead. We saw the fan and sheep. We saw grizzly bears. We saw foxes. It was unbelievable. It's a fantastic place. It's one of the great conservation opportunities in Canada. And it's really beautiful. And I hope that some great conservation story can come out of this area where the Casca people live. Uh, because, wow, is it great. And it's not just great at a local scale or a Yukon scale. It's just plain great at an international scale. So there's more work to be done in this part of the world. And as we come to this idea of reconciliation and the question of how we relate to the natural world and the question of how we want the world to go, who we want to be in the world, is a really important conceptual thing for us to focus on. And that is, we are inhabitants of the earth. We share the earth as one species among many. Humans are animals, dependent on air and water and food like every other organism. That's the context for all life, including human life. Inside the earth is human society. 
That's where we have our families, we have our relationships, we have our ambitions, and we have our economy. Inside human society is the economy. The economy is there for only one reason, and that's to serve humans. It's not there for any other reason. It's there to serve human society. And yet the way we talk about it all the time is the economy can't afford this. Okay. Who is the economy? It doesn't have a soul. It doesn't breathe. It's there to serve people. And yet we've privileged it, and we've got this completely backwards. Or in the most enlightened condition, we show it as three interlocking rings where you're trying to find the sweet spot between the environment and the economy and human society. It's all nonsense. The only thing that matters is the context for all of our life. And we're beating it up bad. The climate is changing. There's a tsunami of extinctions going on. We're, nature is falling apart. We have to stand up and make nature hold together. We need to think of nature's needs. We need to practice reconciliation with Mother Earth. And this is where we can bring indigenous worldviews together with Western science and imagine as Canadians a really positive and productive future in which we actually live as good citizens of planet Earth. Imagine. Imagine the hope in that instead of the despair of things are going badly and we can't do anything. And that's within our power. We just have to want it. We have to want it the way the Bhutanese want it. We just have to want it. We just have to do it. Whoops, I went the wrong way there. So I'm going to ask you a question. Anybody know what this is? Romulus and Remus. The founding of Rome. When did we go off the rails as Westerners from an understanding that we were one species among many that shared the world with the rest of life and somehow superior? It was with the rise of the Roman empires. They were great engineers. This is the founding of Rome. This is Romulus and Remus, and at the founding of Rome, they were suckled by a wild she-wolf. The metaphor, of course, is that nature nurtures us. Nature keeps us alive. By the time they were done, humans run the world. It's there for us. And we grew up with that mythology right through to that image of American progress, of the world is there for us to subdue, tame, and make progress on, and we drive out all the wild pieces. We need to get back to this, which interestingly, indigenous cultures around the world have not lost. They didn't lose this insight. The rest of us lost it. We've had a 2,000-year mental lapse. And this is why the wisdom of indigenous people can be important to the future, not just because we need to make it better, but because they're right. So there we are under the little arrow on this big place called planet Earth. And I hope that here in Yukon you can do something great for the world. Keep it intact. Think of the caribou as an indicator. If you've got your caribou, you've got your life, and you're serving the world. And thank you very much for having me. Okay, so we're going to take a little bit of time now to do a question and answer. Uh, we've got two volunteers who are going to take some microphones. Uh, I'm not sure where the microphones are, but hopefully we can get them set up. While we do that, I just want to put down a few ground rules for everyone. I know rules are fun, but uh, let's set some out. Uh, the first is that when you ask your question, it would be great for you to introduce yourself. Um, say your name if you're with an organization or a group introduce yourself through that group. Uh, the other thing that would be great for everyone to do is to try and keep your questions short. Try and keep it to less than a minute. And if you're going over around a minute 30, we might have to cut you off. So please try and keep it concise. We've got lots of people here, and I'm sure lots of questions. Um, so with that, while we get these microphones sorted, I'm going to start. I'm going to ask a question. Hi, Harvey. My Hello. name is Chris. Hello, Chris. Uh, I'd like to ask a question. We have a number of decision makers uh, who are in this room, and if they could take one thing away from this talk tonight, what would be that one message that you'd like them to walk away with? Uh, that they don't perceive Yukon as a failed southern state, but they perceive it as an opportunity for the future of the world.
You know, part of the mythology that I pick up is that in the North, people want to be like the South. They want to be independent of the federal government. They want all this economic activity that will allow that. Instead, I think we should invert that as Canadians and say, this is a special part of the world, and people like me should be happily sending money up here. We should be encouraging all Canadians to come up here for their education, their experience, and the Yukon should be developed in a way that invites people in to experience the fantastic nature of it. And it can also be a leader in this idea of reconciliation because the opportunity is so great because you still have intact cultures. And uh, I didn't dwell on that too much, but many of your indigenous people still know how to live on the land. That's not everywhere. And that's really important to maintain. And so all of that together makes this a very, very special place. And you can have lots of economic activity. This is a really big place. You can still have mines if you want mines. But you don't have to... You will lose the things that make it special if you don't act to keep them permanently. There is no, it's wild, it'll stay that way, laissez-faire. You can see those trend maps all over the world. If it ain't protected, it's going to go. And that's the big message I would share. Thank you. And I can see we've got a question here. Yes, my name is Jerry Steers. I was one of the founders and former director and just current <clears throat> member of McIntyre Creek. I've been hiking that area around the college for 30 years. My question to you is with the whistle bend development and, and the increased area filled up with houses around the McIntyre Creek, with what's left, is that enough to save the corridor? Uh, it, it's interesting, you know, I, I have spent the last two days on it, so I'm not an instant expert, but I'm not a complete ignoramus, and I did fly it. There's lots there to save. It's not toast at all. And unfortunately, there's lots of, there, there are things that interfere with the quality of the creek, the highway going across it, little culverts, those are real issues, but they could be opened up over time and restored. That's a really still great place. You know, we watched bald eagles flying up and down the creek today, uh, we watched little fox, uh, red foxes uh, walking around, red squirrels. I mean, it was marvelous. It's a great place. And, you know, it may be passe or blasé for people on Whitehorse to think, oh, you know, I saw seven bald eagles today. That's a big deal. That's like a really big deal that you have seven bald eagles in the city of Whitehorse and just in that one valley that I saw today. I mean, it's incredible. That's a wonderful, wonderful asset. And the, long, the more the city grows, the more it prospers, the more that asset will be valued. If you think of New York City, do you think anybody there regrets Central Park? Uh, Bombay, one of the largest, Mumbai, Bombay. If you're in Bombay, they call it Bombay still. It's very interesting. Um, it has a big national park. 30% of the area of Bombay is national park. It's still got leopards in it. Nairobi, Kenya, has a big national park right on the edge of the city with lion. It's got both kinds of rhinoceros, white and black. It's got Cape Buffalo. It's a fantastic place, right on the edge of the city of Nairobi. And so you can do that here. And you can restore the things that are missing here as best you can. And, you know, one of the challenges is, you know, well, there's lots more out there somewhere. Actually, there isn't lots more out there somewhere. All there is is what's in front of you. And the low elevation river corridors like McIntyre Creek, that's where the ecological action is for the whole landscape. So you can see I like it. Microphones uh, this side and someone up the back there if anyone's got a question. Okay. And back there. Just throw the mic like a hot dog at a baseball game. Yeah. Look at that. Uh, hi, I'm Fox, and my question to you is, uh, how far would you consider too much? A lot of the time, despite the fact, obviously, we've got a lot of people here who do care about preserving this, it's not uncommon for decision makers and for the vast majority of the population to really not care. So 
would you consider it fair and or just that even if more than 50% of the population thinks something should be developed, which is probably against better judgment, should things still be done to protect this? Well, democracy is an interesting thing. Um, and, you know, we're lucky that we live in a democracy. Um, but I think the, the really important thing as we look at the future, and I don't mean just here in Yukon, I mean in Canada and around the world, and I spend a lot of time going around the world now. I'm doing stuff on every continent all the time. The number one issue that I see that inflicts everyone is despair. Is despair about the future. And it's particularly acute in people who are under 25. And it's really interesting. If you're gray-haired like me, when I was 15 years old, I wasn't despairing about the future. I was, it was interesting. I don't know. I was distracted. But I wasn't afraid of the future. We now have a whole generation of people who are afraid of the future. And they're afraid of the climate frying on their watch. They're afraid of everything going extinct. They're afraid there won't be a job for them. That's a failure of older people because the job of a, a generation is to give hope to the next generation, to give meaning. That's our job and we're failing. We have failed them and we can't fail them. Our job is to set it right. Our job is to set in motion a vision of the world that's hopeful and positive and fun and cool and I want in. Nature conservation is the foundation of such a vision. If we don't save the earth, the rest is noise. And we're at that place now where we just must act. And so it's always worth the fight to save nature. Will you win every fight? No. Is it always worth the fight? Yes. And the really, really cool thing I can tell you as somebody who's now spent time working on stuff and out in the bush from the middle of Africa to the Himalayas to the middle of Brazil, um, I've been all over the place. People love nature everywhere. Every person of every skin color, there are nature-loving people everywhere on earth. And the key thing is to raise the voice because the really challenging thing as a person who loves nature is there's nothing in it for you. You don't get richer in the bank. You don't demonstrate jobs if you love nature. You just have a good life. And you just have a more meaningful existence. That's a value we have to elevate. We have to say that's a good thing, not a bad thing. It's an important thing, not a marginal thing. It's a central part of having a hopeful future, which is what we don't have now. Short answer. Hello, my name's Dixie Smeaton, um, Champagne Ajax First Nation. Uh, Indian name is Atskia. I really enjoyed your presentation. Um, one of the things I have a question about is land use planning and the importance of land use planning and examples of successful land use planning. We are planning and planning and planning <laughs> like crazy, but we have like a, a small amount of uh, human resources within our uh, Heritage Lands and Resource Department. And we're trying our darndest. But um, uh, are there examples of where, because I understand, like, it was, was it the art of war where they say failure to plan is planning to fail? But um, are there examples somewhere that you know of where they went through a planning process and it shows that it works on the other end? Oh, boy, I wish I had a long list of that. Um, you know, the, the Canadian solution of not making a hard decision is to plan. Plan, 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 plan. Let's do a revised plan. Let's do another consultation on the plan. Let's then litigate the failure to contemplate. And when you go to court and you win, they send it back to the planning process. Sound familiar? You know, we have to make decisions. And then we have to make decisions that are enduring and meaningful. And the problem is that a lot of the decisions that uh, I'm guessing that your First Nation, certainly others, would advocate for are ones that are more about the integrity and the health of the land than they are about more and more economic activity of, of different varieties. And we have to just honor that and allow it to be done, not to say let's plan and talk and plan some more. 
And this is actually our challenge. Is, you know, it, it's kind of embarrassing as a Canadian. We're, um, we're among the wealthiest people who've ever lived on planet Earth, unquestionably. We have the second largest country in the world, and we only right now can protect 12% of it. 30% of Tanzania is protected. It's like the 20th poorest country in the world. I mean, it's really embarrassing. And it's because we plan and plan and plan and we can't get over it. We can't just make decisions. And yes, having coherent, thoughtful planning is a good idea. Having outcomes is even a better idea. Real, solid outcomes that we then don't revisit, especially the ones that secure natural capital, those are the ones we need to lock down. And it's a real big reason why I'm a believer in parks, particularly national parks. Because they're, once they, you've got them, you have to persuade someone in Ottawa to undo it. If you have an administrative decision, then all you have to do is persuade the department to undo the decision. And the department could be very local. Or if you, you know, the higher the scale, the more enduring it is. And I know there have been issues about the exclusion of Indigenous people in parks, and I think we're getting that right now. We sure as heck should get it right. But the opportunity to secure the land base is the fundamental thing we have to do. And to secure the natural processes like rivers running freely, and in some places, forests burning freely. That's part of how the world works. And if we get that right, we'll have our society right. Question over there. A very short question from Walter Yukon Conservation Society. What do you think about the formula if you want to take care about yourself, you have to take care about the environment. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> Who's got the mic? Hello. Ooh. Uh, hello. Um, my name is Mary, and I'm a member of the Con Yukon Conservation Society. And my question is about oh, greenies. Um, people who love to hike and paddle and ski and mountain bike in the wilderness. And could you say something about protected areas being protected against even people being in it versus protected areas being protected from development? Oh, yeah. So you're raising what's a really important question, which is, can you love something to death? Um, yes, you can. And one of the greatest issues is, can we practice self-restraint, um, even if it's something you want to do? It's, it's a lot easier to practice restraint if it's the other person who has to stop. Uh, but if you have to stop, like, how do you feel about that? Well, you know, it, what's really interesting is, I think there's actually freedom in self-restraint. I think if, if we had a society that was functioning in the way I'd like it to, where you say, you know, we're going to stay out of there because it's calving season for whatever species is there. And we're going to stay out of there joyously because we know we're going to allow that to have its calf. Or it's uh, in this area, we should stay out because the caribou need to move through there and my snowmobile or my cross-country skiing will disrupt a critical movement of caribou in a time of great stress. Well, I love to ski. I love to hike. I'm very happy to stay out of areas that are closed. Like, I'm really happy to do it because I'm even happier to know that those things are alive and sharing the world with me. But it's, we've become so me-focused as a culture. You know, I'm not going to accuse everybody in this room as being as old as me. But I'll tell you, when I was a young person, to say, I want, I'm greedy, um, this is about me, that was inexcusable. Does anybody remember that? It was inexcusable. Like, I remember uh, thinking, uh, my mother's going to strike me dead if I take a selfie. <laughs> you know what I'm talking about, those of you who are laughing. You know, and we've moved into this incredibly narcissistic, it's me, 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 I, 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 I want, I want, I need it now stuff. 
And it even, and it's not just those guys, the bad guys, so to speak. There aren't bad guys. We're all in this together. But we have to practice self-restraint too. But I think that's where the joy can be. And it's all got to do with the world you want to live in. Has anybody ever heard of framing? It's a concept of how people make sense of the world. A lot of us were raised believing that if there's good information, smart people will weigh it carefully and the right decision will come out the other end. Does anybody know that framework for decision making? It's called the Enlightenment decision making model. We were all taught it in school at one point. That's why science is important. We'll weigh it in this. Turns out it's all hogwash. It's not how the human brain works. The human brain works actually against what are called mental frames. And the frames are coherent pictures of the world, how you want it to be, and you organize information and you process it through at that frame. And if your frame is everything's going to hell, dog eat dog, I'm on top, I need to cash in and do this, then you will do everything selfishly. And if your frame is, I want other things to do well, I want to be generous of spirit, I want to know that if I had a problem, someone else would look after me, and if I never have a problem, then I'm the luckiest person in the world and I'm happy to be generous, then you're happy to restrain yourself too. And we have to be having conversations as a society about what kind of narrative frame we want to live in. And we've allowed this greed, self-interest, uh, boundless um, narcissism to become the norm in our culture. And it's killing us. And it's going to give us crazy deals. Do you know that there's a huge part of the younger population in North America that thinks democracy is a failure? And in the United States, half of young people crave a strongman leader? Yeah. Yeah. It's because we're rootless and boundless, and the strong man will save us. So these are really important things for us to work on. Should we do two more questions? Okay. I'm Dave, and uh, <laughs> when I learned how our voting system works, I became very concerned about it because half the voters are not represented. And I think to give meaning to voting would give an awful lot of hope to people. What do you think about that? Well, buried in that might be the idea of electoral reform of some kind. <laughs> um, and you know, I'm actually not, uh, I, I've run for office, I've run for parliament, and I've run for the provincial legislature, and I've been president of a political party. And what I've learned from that is democracy is horribly flawed all the time. And thank God we have it. Uh, because the alternatives are really bad. And I've been in countries where it's really bad, where they don't have it. And our system is flawed, but any cure also has its own flaws in it. And I actually think we do pretty well in our democracy. Um, and I voted in a losing cause in many, many elections. I'm a liberal from Alberta. Um, so I, I know lots about that. Um, but the fundamental thing for me that's really important is decisions are made in democracies and in any other part of life by those who show up. And you have to show up. And even if it isn't great, if you don't show up, the decisions are made for you in the absence of you. And it's amazing, you know, in Alberta, it was impossible for the NDP to form a majority government. I'm an expert on Alberta politics. There's no way that could have happened. No way, not a chance. It happened. I even like them, and I'm not an NDP. It's amazing. It happened, even in our flawed system, even though people would say, I voted NDP for 60 years and it never mattered. They got an NDP majority government because they looked competent and the mood for change was there. So we can make big changes in our system. And I fear tinkering with our democratic system because I think it's very fragile right now. And I think we have to work it hard and get people to believe in it and work on it. So I wouldn't tinker with it, even though I certainly understand the anxieties that, that, that are very, very fair. Hi, Harvey. It's uh, Pippa Lawson. We've met him on the National Board of Trustees of CPAS. Um, thanks very much. I, I 
if I'm the last, I hope I'm not the last question. If I am, it's kind of a micro question. I hope you can bring it to the macro level. Um, I'm thinking of McIntyre Creek, and I'm thinking of bears and wolves and this wilderness city, so-called wilderness city that we live in, in which we killed something like 60 bears last year in the city of Whitehorse, and in which wolves also seem not to be tolerated. The, the concept of wolves or bears killing your pet dog is just, it, there's zero tolerance, it appears, for people walking in McIntyre Creek and being scared by a bear, and that seems to be cause for it to be um, put to death. Anyway, I have two questions. One. What is your view of, of that? Of in, a, in a municipal area, should there be any tolerance for bears and wolves? And the second question is, how should we be managing this problem? Boy, you know, that's a, what they call a softball question. Honestly, she didn't schedule it ahead of time because I'm going to give a great answer. So we live in the town of Banff, okay, my wife Marev and I. We have grizzly bears within 50 meters of our house. We have cougars and we have wolves. We've had moose. We have amazing wildness around, all around the town of Banff. We have, on a given summer day, the population of the town of Banff heavily exceeds that of Whitehorse. You know why we have them? Because we have a policy that we have to tolerate them. And we gar manage our garbage. It's a huge thing. We manage our garbage. If you don't have attractants outside, you don't have as many human wildlife conflicts. And if there's a bear in an area that is known to be in the area, then we have trail closures for a while. You can't go there. Tell the bears out of there with their cubs or something. But a lot of the time, the bears are just in the landscape with us, and it's all fine. And it, it really is a lovely way to live. We saw a grizzly bear the other day in Banff Park called the boss, great big guy. Fantastic thing to see. We have four million visitors a year in Banff Park. We manage our garbage, we have a policy of tolerance, we still have the animals. And it's all in our heads. What we like, what's scary, what isn't scary, what we can learn to live with. And yes, if there's a Hannibal Lecter bear who's out there marauding, eating babies, call the wildlife officer, get rid of it. But there aren't that many Hannibal Lecter humans, and there aren't that many Hannibal Lecter bears. And wolves, they don't like to eat people, notwithstanding the rumors. They don't. I've been around lots of wild wolves out in the bush. They don't bug me, I don't bug them. My wife had a face-to-face -face encounter with a wolf about three meters away a couple of years ago, and they had a good visit, and then they moved on. Um, and, and we can live with wild nature, we just have to want to. <laughs>